in this presentation, we'll be talking about your impaired esophageal motility disorder. So we'll be talking about your achalasia and esophageal spasm. The picture here shows the result of manometry. If you can recall our discussion in assessment, your manometry is used to measure the pressure in the esophagus going towards your LES or your lower esophageal sphincter. So we'll be talking about these anatomical uh, parts of our body in this discussion. So let's talk about achalasia. The problem in achalasia is that it is a disorder characterized by progressive increasing dysphagia. And why is this dysphagia happening to our patient? The problem is that there is absent or ineffective peristalsis to the distal esophagus. And there is a failure of the LES to relax. Okay? There is a failure of the LES to relax. In other words, what happens is that, for example, when the food passes through here, instead of the LES opening, the LES keeps on closing. Okay? It's still closed. So, there is narrowing of the esophagus above the stomach, as you can notice, and then there will be gradual dilation of the upper chest esophagus. It becomes gradually progressive later on. So, it is characterized by progressive increasing dysphagia. Sometimes, the patient will say that they feel that something is stuck in the throat. That is because of the slow transit of the food going towards the stomach. So the tendency of the food, instead of going down to the stomach, because the LES is closed, the food is getting stuck in the esophagus. And once there are a lot of food getting stuck in the esophagus, the patient will be able to feel it in his throat. Occurrence, it is increased among those who are age 40 and higher. For the pathophysiology of your achalasia, this is attributed to the defective innervation of your involuntary muscles of the esophagus. So if you can recall in our discussion in anatomy, okay, your LES is innervated by your sympathetic and your parasympathetic nervous system. So in this case, there is defective control of your muscles of the esophagus. This results to the incomplete relaxation of the LES or the failure of the LES to open when it needs to be opened. Hence, there is failure also in the lower two-thirds of the esophagus. Again, because of defective innervation and incomplete relaxation of the LES. As you can recall again, once food would transit from your esophagus going towards your stomach, you would expect the LES to be open. But in this case, it is not fully open. Okay? So if you would look at it, this is almost contrary to what's happening in your GERD. Because in your GERD, the less is open. There is weakness of your less. In this case, your less does not open or it is not completely open. I hope that differentiates your achalasia and your GERD. Now, your diffuse esophageal spasms. So, we are, they are discussed simultaneously because they have similarity and differences also. So, your diffuse esophageal spasm is characterized by a motor disorder wherein there is non-propulsive, non-peristaltic tertiary contractions. So, we expect that there is peristalsis along the line of your esophagus. But what's happening in your diffuse esophageal spasms is that there is movement, there is contract. However, these contractions are non-propulsive, non-peristaltic. Okay? The less is functioning normally. This is common among women and middle age. The cause is idiopathic, not known to us, but it is attributed to stress, more common among women compared to men. And then you have a specific type that we referred to as your nutcracker esophagus, which is common among patients with mental health disorders and on psychiatric medication. So, your esophageal spasms is actually divided into two kinds. So, you have your diffuse esophageal spasm and then you have your hypertensive peristalsis. So, your diffuse esophageal spasm is described as uncoordinated movements of your esophagus. Okay, it's considered normal in amplitude. However, it is quick and occurs in many places or many parts of the esophagus. So, if you would look at the name of the disease, when I say diffuse, diffuse occurs in many places. Just think of it like that. Okay? And then spasm, usually quick and uncoordinated. For you to remember what is the characteristic for this disease. Then we have your hypertensive peristalsis. In your hypertensive peristalsis, also known as your nutcracker esophagus, what happens is that the movement seems to be coordinated. However, there is increase in amplitude or pressure in your esophagus. And then sometimes it can result to what you refer to as your jackhammer esophagus. When I say jackhammer esophagus, there is extreme 
Okay, this is an extreme form of your hypertensive peristalsis or nutcracker esophagus, wherein it is already the entire esophagus which is involved for a prolonged period of time. Okay, so the contractions which are involuntary for the entire esophagus is already prolonged. Okay, so that's what we refer to as jackhammer esophagus. So just as a quick recap, for your esophageal spasm, there are two main types. You have your diffuse esophageal spasm, and then you also have your hypertensive peristalsis. Under your hypertensive peristalsis, if it will be continuous, you refer to that one as your jackhammer esophagus. So what happens to our patient? As mentioned, this is idiopathic, but related to fragmented degeneration of the vagus nerve fibers. So when I say degeneration of your vagus nerve, okay, as the patient ages, we know that there is degeneration of the nerve. And then we know that your vagus nerve is the parasympathetic stimulator of our GI tract, especially that of your stomach and your esophagus. Now, if there is fragmented degeneration, meaning a part only of the vagus nerve has degenerated first, and then another part later on, and then another part later on, okay, it might cause your in uh, voluntary contractions. So take note, as I have mentioned, that esophagus is expected to have peristalsis, but this peristalsis is necessary movement. Our problem here in your achalasia and your diffuse esophageal spasm, especially I mean on diffuse esophageal spasm, is that there is simultaneous, repetitive, high-pressure contractions which are not needed by our esophagus. Okay, so it's an exaggerated contraction. Here, it results to severe intermittent chest pain, dysphagia, and then also regurgitation and then food impaction on the part of our patient. So food gets impacted inside the esophagus because it could not move down because of this unnecessary movement. Then, so these are the manometer results that I've been telling you. So the red lines there or the red color usually show the pressure. And then as you progress down, okay, it uh, is the length along the esophagus. Okay, this is a BESA explained to us by a gastroenterologist. Then the assessment finding for your achalasia. So take note, again, let's go back to achalasia. When I say achalasia, your problem is that there is absent or ineffective peristalsis in the distal esophagus. So your patient would have chronic or progressive dysphagia because the food could not go down. Chest pain because also the food is not going down. Regurgitation during meal or several hours after because again, the LES could not be completely open, food cannot go down. Your patient may have coughing, heartburn, and also weight loss, ineffective nutrition later on because your patient will not be taking food because of the discomfort that results from taking food. Then, for your DES or your diffuse esophageal spasm, your patient would also have anterior chest pain, heartburn, adenophagia, regurgitation. This is aggravated by your large meal and hot and cold liquid because your extreme temperatures could trigger the spasms of your patient. Diagnostic studies. So our diagnostic studies for your achalasia would involve the use of your x-ray and then your esophageal manometry. Manometry again is the measure of your pressure. Then this one is uh, showing your barium swallow. So your patient has swallowed barium and then series of x-rays were taken using your fluoroscopy. As you can see class, this is what we refer to as the classic bird beak narrowing, which can be found in your um, achalasia. Okay, the classic sign for your achalasia is the bird beak narrowing. So this is what they refer to as the beak of the bird. Other references would say a uh, tail of the rat. Okay, so in this case, it would look like beak of the bird or either rat's tail. So classic in the imaging of your achalasia. Because again, the problem is what? The LES is not completely relaxed whenever there is food that ought to pass through from the esophagus to your stomach. Okay, remember that. Uh, please be reminded that the diagnostic test used to confirm for your achalasia is still your esophageal manometry because it is your esophageal manometry which will be able to identify the pressure in the LES, which is the main problem in achalasia. Now, let's go to the diagnostic test for your DES. For your DES, the diagnostic test is your barium swallow still, okay, also referred to as your barium esophagography because after all, we are visualizing the esophagus. But look at the appearance. It appears like a corkscrew or sometimes they would refer to it as rosary bead appearance, so which is classic for your diffuse esophageal spasm. So as you can see, there is involuntary movements here. There are contractions occurring there, which prevents the esophagus okay, from being straightened up. 
Okay, those are results by spasms on the esophagus. And then we also have your esophageal manometry. Then, medical management for your achalasia. So we advise our patient to eat slowly. Okay, fluids with meals are usually recommended. So semi-solid uh, diet is recommended to allow from the, for the transit of the food from the esophagus going towards the stomach and at the same time decreasing the risk for aspiration. Then warm food and liquid in four to six smaller meals rather than having three full meals in a day because remember there is narrowing of your LES. Then we give medications such as your anticholinergic drugs, then you also have your nitrates, your calcium channel blockers, and your Botox injection. For this medication, ask yourselves, what is the purpose why we are giving this medication to a patient with achalasia? And what are the example medications under the categories anticholinergic, nitrates, and calcium channel blockers that are best used for a patient with achalasia? And what are the possible side effects for these medications? The procedure that can be done for our patient with achalasia is referred to as your esophageal pneumatic dilatation. So this is used for those who do not respond to the usual uh, medications that are used to relax the LES. So uh, here what happens is that uh, you, a balloon is being inserted going towards the esophagus and the LES of the patient with the purpose of stretching the narrowed area of the esophagus. So as you can see, a pneumatic uh, balloon is inserted and then inflated by the time that it enters your LES okay, with the uh, aim that there will be a restoration of flow after the balloon will be removed. Okay, but uh, there is risk for perforation and pain associated with this procedure. Because of the risk for pain, we usually give our patient or we our patient are usually placed on moderate sedation with the use of your analgesia and tranquilizers. So that would remind us of our anesthesia protocol and safety guidelines for our patient. Then we also have your esophagomyotomy or your Heller myotomy. So this is a surgical procedure in which the muscles of the cardia are cut, allowing for the food and liquid to pass to the stomach. So this is a use for the management of your achalasia to facilitate the passage of the food. So what happens is that, uh, as you can see, okay, there is trapping of food here in achalasia okay, because of the narrowing again of your LES or the failure of your LES to relax. What is being done is that uh, it's opened up here in the esophagus and then part of the cardia of the stomach is being sutured to that part of the esophagus. The purpose of which is for the food okay, to move okay, towards the cardia of the stomach rather than going through the LES. Okay, so it's like a bypass okay, or an alternative route for the food that our patient is taking. So again, that is referred to as esophagomyotomy or your Heller myotomy. Then the medical management for your DES. This time it's recommended to have soft diet, to have your small frequent feeding in a pride position still to prevent your reflux. Then primary treatment. Since we're talking about spasms, okay, you know when you're talking about muscular spasms, your calcium channel blockers are your drug of choice. So uh, what are the examples of your calcium channel blockers again? Then what are the examples of nitrates? And what is an example of sedative? And why are we giving this medication to our patient? Your book would also say that we are giving sildenafil to our patient. If you can recall, your sildenafil is a drug for erectile dysfunction. So why are we giving sildenafil to a patient with DES? Also, why are we giving anticholinergic agents for this patient? Why are we giving TCAs to this patient? And what is the purpose of the administration of your proton pump inhibitor? Kindly take note of your answers to this question. And then another thing is esophageal dilation could also be done, but myotomy is uh, rarely used for the management of your DES. Then nursing management. Our goal here is to improve the nutritional status of the patient. That's why we recommend diet for them. For example, in achalasia, we recommend your semi-solid warm food. For your DES, we recommend a soft diet for our patient. Then promote comfort, hence the administration of your medication. And then monitor for post-op complications. So post-op complication is usually pain and then perforation because we're talking about abdomen. There may be bleeding, so you need to watch out for signs of bleeding. And then teach the client how to swallow. Okay, it's indicated in your handouts. You choose food with shape and moist to prevent crumbling. Then you also need to teach the patient on the proper mugs and glasses that we use. Okay, foods that need to be food, I mean, that need to be avoided and food that can be taken. 
you may pause this slide to read through the education uh, points that we can give our patient during mealtime. And you also need to know what about if there is increased saliva, what if there will be dry mouth, and what will be the caution that you will be giving to your patient when talking while eating. You may pause the slides. Then we watch out for complications. So you have the lung problems and then the weight loss. You know, lung problems, when I talk about reflux, when I talk about esophageal problems, lung problems follow because of risk for aspiration. Then weight loss. So weight loss related to imbalanced nutrition, less than body requirements. Okay, as mentioned in the possible nursing diagnosis. So imbalanced nutrition, less than body requirements. Related to the structural problem of your esophagus or related to the involuntary contractions of your esophagus. Presence of pain, the knowledge deficit, and then anxiety or fear for your patient. In the incoming lecture, we'll be discussing about the disturbances in digestion. And we will start with gastrointestinal bleeding. Thank you for your attention on this one.